Main Street never looked the same to me. When I make that turn to come here after the storm, it never looked the same because all those beautiful trees that we had there, you know, we were tree city. We even never lost trees. And when I came in that morning and, and they had the log trucks downtown, I was like, not in tree city. <laughs> Many of us, I had never experienced a hurricane of that magnitude before. You read about them, you, you, you see them on TV news and so forth, but to actually go through it, it was, um, it was, it was hard to describe. It was a moment I don't think we ever expected would happen and it was something that none of us had ever experienced. Um, and like I say, we learned a lot of good and we learned a lot of uh, not so good. It's really heartbreaking to think about it. You know, this is a place that I've been in all of my life and of all the hurricanes that we had, this was the one that took it away. It was remarkable, I, I'll tell you. This county was really devastated by that storm, but the people did come back together. We have a low just off the coast of Africa that we're watching. This could become a tropical depression in the next 24 hours or so. And this is Isabel, and Isabel is a hurricane. And that is looking more and more impressive on the satellite picture. Let's go ahead and look at the latest on Isabel. Uh, located or centered 1,430 miles to the east of the Leeward Islands. Sustained winds of 90 miles. So there were meetings all the time from the beginning when it looked like we were going to be impacted. And of course, at first, it looked like it was going be the Outer Banks and you know when that happens then people from the Outer Banks start booking here to get out of the hurricane and then you know then you had other people coming from other places. We're also seeing an eye show up in the satellite imagery now which suggests that it might be starting to get a little better organized so we need to watch and if the thunderstorms continue to wrap around the center and the eye becomes better defined then we definitely have a hurricane that's on a strengthening cycle stewart adds isabel could cause flooding in many areas one of the things that makes isabel um, a little bit of an outlier compared to a lot of our hurricanes when you think back if folks know hurricane fran hurricane floyd hurricane hazel they came at state in north carolina from the south so they made landfall around Wilmington or, you know, maybe just west of Jacksonville, North Carolina. And that's kind of an all of what we call our classic track, you know, it's coming up. And then so when it hits further south like that, I mean, sometimes the, the, the wind of the storm's taken out a little bit by the time it gets to Edenton, takes a little bit of the, you know, the oomph out of the storm. Isabel um, was a bit of a different approach. So instead of going straight north, it was coming at us from the southeast. Um, moving northwest. So it's coming right directly at basically the Outer Banks. Now the projected path of Isabel take it here uh, basically a north-northwest turn in the next several days. Right now the area shaded in the dark yellow is more certain path where the lighter shades is definitely where we're gonna have to keep a close eye on as we get into the middle to the end of next week. So we're keeping a close eye here on Isabel and it's going to take until next week to uh, see exactly where I it mean, is. It was to forecast go. to come straight in for days on end, uh, coming right in south of Ocracoke. Uh, you know, it was a Category 5 hurricane at one point out there in the Atlantic um, that made it a very dangerous storm. It had a very large wind field. And something that really worked for us about a year prior to Isabel, we had developed one of the first membership-based communication pieces. Uh, we could put in a piece to in, into our computers at the office, which is almost like constant contact is today, or so it was all kind of before then, but we had instant communication to all 300 chamber members. 
so as the um, as those storms would approach, weather bulletins, EMS would shoot those to us. We would send those out. So all of a sudden, they had 300 business people, and then you can start thinking where well, each business had 10 or 15, in some cases, three and 400 people working for them. So they were able to disperse that information. So all of a sudden, you had information just flying out to the community that was coming from a good source, a reliable source, the county and the town. So the strongest predictors were the commercial fishermen. They could look in the sky, look at the radar, and have that sixth sense. They knew what was coming. And when they started battening down the hatches and pulling their boats higher than 10 feet away from the water, that's their livelihood. That boat is their office. When they started battening down the hatches, I live right there at Rocky Hawk Creek, and all the commercial fishermen could get, that could got their boats out. And that t told everybody, this is going to be tough. Moving to the west-northwest at 13 miles per hour, and now we're plotting it toward the eastern seaboard, 850 miles away from Cape Hatteras. I don't think even the folks that had been here working, born raised here, anticipated the devastation we were going to see. Uh, but we went through our normal procedure, uh, first time for me, but I had a good staff that had done it before. And so, you know, getting supplies in, making sure we have staff, making sure we have a place for staff to sleep. Um, at the time, uh, we weren't, we were part of the University Health Systems of Eastern Carolina, which eventually became Vidant. You know, they had put in a non-potable well, so we had some well water, not anticipating this to happen. But again, where this exactly and how close it will be and how where, how, where it will be in proximity to the U.S. remains to be seen. So we want you to just cautiously watch it and just kind of think in the back of your mind, early part of the week, I need to maybe start making some decisions on what I might do. Boy, it really looks impressive here. I grew up in Florida and I moved here from the Gulf Coast, near the Gulf Coast uh, in, uh, in South Alabama. So we, we had, I had experienced hurricanes. Uh, but certainly nothing to the uh, degree and the, and the level of devastation of Isabel. That was by far, uh, I, I experienced Donna, Hurricane Donna back in the 60s in Daytona. I thought that it couldn't get much worse than that, but uh, certainly this was quite a test for all of us. We were following the storm as well, very closely. Uh, and as superintendent, I was a member of the emergency response team. So I was, uh, privy to a lot of that information in terms of the preparation for the community and uh, where it was heading. Uh, and as usual, we uh, dismissed school uh, early on, the, on that Thursday, the day before the storm hit, uh, primarily because uh, two of our schools served as shelters, the middle school for the north end of the county and then the high school here in town for the southern end. So we, we opened the shelters at that point. Just now, in fact, I'm just, boom, doing it right as I'm going on the air, getting the latest from the National Hurricane Center. This looks like a very, very big one. I don't want anybody to panic, but this is going to be a real, real close one for our area. If you've lived through a hurricane in the past, you've never lived through one like this. I just remember realizing that, you know, the likelihood of significant damage was really, really high and that we needed to do everything we could to alert the public. And back then, you know, we didn't have social media. We, we didn't have the communication network that we have now. And I, I just, I, we were really, really worried. I remember um, Cliff and the commissioners and then of course, you know, Mayor Vaughn and our town council members, we were really, worried about people living in low-lying areas. You know, we were worried about the storm surge and we wanted to make sure that, you know, in town, the people on Pembroke Circle were aware that this was going to be a really dangerous storm. And we sent the police out, you know, ahead of time, like a day ahead of time saying, you know, you gotta be prepared. You probably don't wanna stay here. You know, do you have somewhere to go? Can we help you get somewhere? So the best thing you can do right now, keep tuning back, keep updated on the current situation, start thinking about what you would need to do if you were asked to evacuate, what your route's going to be, or if you're going to stick it out 
what will you need? Batteries for flashlights if your power goes out, probably need plenty of canned goods and anything that you could potentially need, at least start thinking about. And then when you've got to be called into action. There was lots of boarding up, lots of sandbagging, lots of prayer. Um, there were a lot of making sure we had our lines of communication open with one another so that when it did hit, if it was as bad as we thought it could be, that we would be able to communicate with each other. Uh, th that was a huge part of the preparation. Uh, remembering also that communication wasn't as sophisticated as it is right now. I mean, it's 20 years ago, but it was, it was not as, you, you couldn't just text a friend. The towers weren't as available. You, uh, there were folks who in, in positions of, of leadership in the community didn't have cell phones uh, that had to go out and get a, a burner phone or a quick cell phone uh, that they could use. If the name Isabel sounds familiar, it's because we already have dealt with a storm called Isabel. It was Tropical Storm Isabel. It threatened the East Coast back in 1985. You may not know this, but hurricane and tropical storm names are actually reused every six years. There are six different lists, and so every six years we see the same names. That is, unless a storm like Andrew does significant damage or kills a significant number of people. And if that happens with Isabel, we will never hear the name Isabel and Tropical Storm or Hurricane again. Wakefield uh, weather was telling us it was going to be tough, that we would probably get some 80 to 90 mile an hour winds and we could expect some bad damage, tree damage. Um, shouldn't be much structural, but they, they expect a lot of trees, power outages and stuff. Uh, at 11 o'clock today, uh, a hurricane watch was issued for the entire North Carolina coast. I've declared a state of emergency for North Carolina. Uh, if Hurricane Isabel continues uh, on the current path, we're expecting hurricane force winds will begin Wednesday night. We knew it was going to be bad. We, we got our operational meetings and we knew when it came in here that it was going to hit us pretty hard. It's not a whole lot of distance here between the ocean and Shoreline County, and it's sure not a whole lot to stop it because all the water and everything we knew was going to come directly right down there and all sound to us and get us. So we were um, anxious, I'll use that term, to get everything in order and have everything set up and ready to go. And it's, it, um, it was an interesting time, I'll use that term. Taking a look at what's going on with the storm, the latest on the hurricane, still a very respectable hurricane, Category 2 storm, 105 mile an hour winds, now moving north northwestward. Well, there was no plywood at the builder's supply at the time. It was M.G. Brown, and uh, you couldn't find a generator. The uh, deck screws sold out quickly because people were screwing things down, and there were preparation in advance. I had plywood over my windows. The latest information from the National Hurricane Center, 120 mile per hour sustained winds. We believe it has weakened since the 11 o'clock update. The movement is northwest at 7. Still a fur piece from the United States. If you consider, if we extrapolate 7 miles per hour out 710 miles, if it were to head toward Cape Hatteras, that's 100 hours away. We do believe that this is going to pick up some speed here. We had never, we've been through a lot of hurricanes in Edenton. We'd never have one hit directly like this did. So we had never made any preparations in the Barker house for how to preserve it or, or what to do. So I happened to see on the news that morning that the path was directly um, towards Edenton. So I, I went down and to the Barker house and uh, realized that we were going to have to get everything out of the first floor uh, if we were going to save it. And we had, you know, paintings and uh, um, antique furniture, rugs, and nobody to move it. Because the day before a hurricane, um, 
every contractor is putting up plywood in different places. I mean, there was just nobody to get to do anything. So uh, we uh, banded together all these little old ladies <laughs> in town and who were uh, part of the Barker Half volunteer staff and people who were on the Indian Historical Commission. And we all carried every piece of furniture upstairs, um, with the exception of one piece, which is a great big round table that still sits in the middle of the parlor, it was too heavy and too big for anybody to, uh, to get up. So we uh, got some concrete blocks and put it up on blocks like people do cars in the yard. Um, and so that everything was off of the floor, everything was off of the walls, because we also didn't know, you know, what wind damage there might be. As the evening wore on, no doubt the preparations continue for Hurricane Isabel. Pretty much a status quo all day today. People getting up, boarding up, and heading on out. That is pretty much what we saw for a good part of today. Hurricane Isabel, it's lost strength, but that doesn't mean it's lost the power to devastate. You're look at, looking at where we believe this hurricane will go and some of the cities that could be affected. What remains to be seen is how much strength it will have when it hits. Officials in North Carolina are ordering folks along the coast to evacuate in anticipation of Hurricane Isabel. Outer Banks residents are... I mean, it did weaken to a Category 2 um, right around landfall, but at that point, it was such a big storm, and the winds were reaching out so far. Um, you had a lot of, of issues with the wind and the wind damage, but that wind is good at pushing water. So it did, a, it did a very efficient job of pushing the Albemarle Sound, you know, basically from east to west. But now it seems to have strengthened in the last few hours, but we're still concerned as to how strong it will be when it finally makes landfall. Now it is expected to make landfall sometime during the day on Thursday, right around the mid-Atlantic areas, North Carolina. And then as the eye of the storm came up, that wind just drove the water right into Edenton. So, so it piled up the water over the western part of the sound, you know, even before the eye of the storm got here. And then when the eye of the storm came, the water that was already piled up, it just drove it, you know, right into Edenton. This is Hurricane Isabel making landfall on North Carolina. Only two days earlier, this was the most powerful hurricane in the Atlantic for five years. If it had made landfall as a Category 5, this area would have been completely destroyed. I want to give you the latest information that has just come off the printer. Estimated near latitude 34.6 north, longitude 75.9 west, or about 35 miles east of Cape Lookout, North Carolina. No doubt we're going to pick it up right where Jeff uh, left off, Hatteras Island. We got big time overwash there. Then you come up this way. We're just starting to get into the surge now in the winds gusting the middle. Throughout the whole storm, I had officers on the road as much as we could. Um, we got to a point where we couldn't get very far down the roads. So each of our cars, there are the officers that were able to handle them and were comfortable with using chainsaws, had chainsaws in the back of the cars and gas and everything ready to go. So they could keep trying to keep the roads as clear as they could for emergency vehicles and stuff like that. And they did pretty good at it until it, the, the height of the storm got to us. It did, it was no way we could keep up at all. Radar picture here shows us that the eye is starting to make landfall on the outer banks of North Carolina. Some very strong gusty winds have been reported. You can see some of the winds on the coast of the Carolinas here. Ocracoke has already had a gust. Two schools opened the shelter, which was Chomar Middle School and Johnny Holmes. So we had the shelter open for anybody in the county, anybody in town. So it was over 300 and something. I know it was. It was, it was, we were packed every night we were packed. September 18th, 2003, I remember it well. Even though it was a category two, it did quite a bit of, quite a bit of damage. My neighbor to the right of me 
uh, at that time, couldn't even get out of her house because trees were blocking her back door and her front door. It's 12.30 on Thursday. Best we could tell, the eye of the hurricane is passing over around Ocracoke. This is the worst wind we've seen, the worst rain we've seen, the worst flooding we've seen. We were providing support as far as working with uh, state emergency management, the governor for the entire state. So we were really focused on what was gonna be happening over Eastern Carolina, especially the Outer Banks, um, all along the Pamlico Sound and all along the Albemarle Sound, um, because we were working into an event that we knew was beyond anybody's experience. Um, it was gonna be a record event, uh, really for the whole Eastern third of the state. Back over to uh, the coast of North Carolina, where we're still looking at the hurricane warnings, uh, some of the locations like Cape Fear under hurricane warnings, northward up to Elizabeth City under hurricane warnings, and tropical storm warnings are currently in effect. I was outside messing with the generator in the building, the back out building. I heard this whom open the door, the generator, our radio tower, you know, has a generator oh, the back there. So the I go outside tower. there and there's a big old tree is laid down oh. <laughs> beside me. I mean, big old tree. We're going to see winds of hurricane force build up during the afternoon. Yellow Hood is our general manager, Ed Munson, who waited out to help. The gentleman without a shirt on is just... It kind of sat over Edenton for a, a long time. And, you know, we moved patients to get them away from windows because we weren't sure that, you know, is debris going to come through? What's going to happen? Uh, I remember we had a lot of leaks. So we we're dealing with the leaks, um, keeping the staff fortified and reinforced. Uh, because, I mean, I think it was a good 24 to 36 hours. So uh, I could even, I had my family with me and a uh, young son. We kept him busy doing things, so I don't think he ever noticed how bad it was. So furious, well, keep in mind that this thing was a Category 4 uh, and also a Category 5 storm at one time. I can remember at one point um, where you go in the side of the building, there was a metal shanty roof, you know, covering the entrance and watching that fly off, you know, piece by piece. And I went running out um, to grab the pieces and somebody said, you're crazy. I said, it's going to hit my car. <laughs> but, you know, we, we had a great staff um, that just responded so well, you know, and, and really did their job most of them not knowing what condition their house was in, you know, because our staff comes from all over. The afternoon before the storm hit, uh, we knew we were in the path. So I went over to the park across the street. I had a, a yardstick with me and I had a cocktail that I was enjoying in the afternoon, knowing what tomorrow could be. And anyway, so Peggy Ann sees me over there with this yardstick, and I'm out at the bulkhead at the farthest point out there where the park comes together, right on the bay. And she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm measuring the water level as it is now to the top of the bulkhead. And then I'm taking that number and I'm going over to our foundation and measure up from the ground to the porch level and add the two together. And that'll tell us how much we can stand before we got to think about flooding. When they say, okay, we're going to have to let school out early, we don't know what's going to happen, and all of that, I'm like, you know, it's, it's not going to happen. But for some reason, that morning when I woke up, it was raining, raining really, really hard. And uh, I was still on Albemarle Street, and in my yard was a huge, I mean, huge pecan tree. And, um, I watched it wave back and forth, and I'm like, I need to get out of this house. Barometric pressure has dropped 28.92. 
been started out this morning at uh, 29. In Isabel's situation, you know, there wasn't a whole lot influencing it. And, and so it, it maintained a true tropical hurricane type, type, you know, storm and it just barreled straight in. It didn't turn, you know, it, it came and made a beeline, you know, straight to uh, Edenton from, from, from Ocracoke. Uh, looks to be without power at this point. No reports of any overwash yet, but uh, uh, we're probably going to be getting some, but particularly from the south side, not so much from the ocean at this point. Again, we'll try to keep reporting as long as we possibly can in these conditions. Let's get back to you. It's the first time we'd had a storm on the other side of us. And it just beat us for six hours. Because, you know, the first couple of hours, the trees didn't go down. Yeah, yeah but it come all that rain. But uh, eventually, toward the last couple of hours, you started seeing most of the devastation, mm -hmm. the trees coming wow. down. It was something I never want to see again. <laughs> You know, um, when you're out there, and particularly, I forget now which officer I had, that was out in the Cape Colony around the airport area and through that area. And he was out there and he said, you know, he called in and said, my land, they, the trees are falling every which way you turn around out here. I mean, the wind is blowing like crazy. I said, there ain't no way we can keep stay out here. I said, well, go on and get out while you can. You know, it just seemed to me like the storm stayed over us so long. I was at the electric department and I had, you know, a map of the town. I had all these um, Sharpies, different colors. And, you know, as I heard uh, reports of, you know, pole down here and I would mark it and I was going to keep track of everything on a map. Well, you know, within like two hours, it just looked like <laughs> spaghetti. Usually, you know, the storms come in and out, but this was here for like several hours of just pounding us. During the storm, as the the floodwaters came in there. We had to evacuate the emergency communications center that afternoon because <laughs> it was we the water. It didn't actually it didn't flood into and flood the building out, but it came right into the back door, just a little ways into the back door. And of course, it was flooded under the building, which is where all the electric was and and all the all the wiring was at. So we had to get out, and we had the um, and around the front of it when we went and evacuated the staff there. Um, the ladies that were working at the communication center at that time that we had to go in, the men had to go in and tote them, bring them out to keep them out of the water. We were in waste deep water, bringing them, wading them out to get them up here to the to where we, they'd be out of the, we'd be out of the water with them. When I saw it flood, like the way the water came up in there really fast, it made me t terrified. Like. Well, we were over at the Creighton's next door playing rummy cube, just going to wait the day out and see, you know, that's just what you do, we'll have a hurricane party. And we kept <clears throat> seeing it out of the dining room window go up and it kept getting higher and higher. And we had only been in that house seven months. We had spent a year restoring it. And seven months later, 
hurricane comes. And we kept seeing it get up higher. And I said, Roland, we've got all that new furniture. We've got all those new drapes. I never can get this stuff again. We've got to go over there. And it was coming in so hard and so fast that we could not go in our front door. Waves were breaking up against the front door. So we had to go in the back door. And um, his shoes, topsiders that he left were floating under the dining room table. Yeah. I had six feet in my measurements and the storm delivered eight. Blunt Street was hit uh, very hard. And I remember particularly um, Jim Blunt and Sally Blunt were hit very hard. Uh, it, was, it was devastating. They had water uh, three feet deep in, in her kitchen. I remember that. But this was the hard hit area. I think water, <laughs> water came on in. Oh, when folks say the Admiral Sound won't come up here and talk to you, and they'll come on up here. Yeah, that, that water, that storm pushed that water right on up. Uh, I have a rental house on Pembroke Circle, and the people who were there um, had to swim out the windows. They had to open the windows and swim out the windows to save their lives. Hawk Crummy, our electric director, was with me and, and um, Bill Potts. And just, I remember looking around the plant and you could hear the trees falling. And then you could hear almost like the, the roof, you thought the roof was gonna blow off. It was like this, you know, tin roof. And, and you just knew, you just knew that the devastation and you were, we were just, you know, hoping and praying that people weren't hurt all these trees falling, you know, on houses. And it really was a miracle that there was not more loss of life. Um, just still unbelievable. But at that time, that was our, our worry, our concern, you know, and, and hoping that people were hunkered down, that people were, you know, going to be okay, and when is this storm going to leave us, dear Lord? Here's the latest satellite imagery from Hurricane Isabel as it continues to move to the northwest. The latest coordinates, 36.2 north, 77.1 west. That's 40 miles east-southeast of Roanoke Rapids. Maximum sustained winds, still Category 1 hurricane uh, winds, 90 miles an hour. And again, it got bad. Like, I remember looking out the window and those big trees behind, uh, like, Pembroke Hall, up King Street, the back these big trees, just like bam, 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 closer and closer. And then I ran through the attic and the roof was like ripple, rippling. I can remember laying down on a floor somewhere, but um, I think it was in the cardiac rehab room and I had my, my, my wife and my son there and we were trying to sleep. And I maybe down an hour and somebody knocked on the door, hey, Mr. Sackerson, the phones are out. We got no phone service at all now. We had, this, we had a satellite phone, but I think even that we were having trouble with communications on. I do know my contractor told me uh, when he built, when we remodeled our old home that we live in, he said, you don't ever have to worry about a leak here unless the wind blows 100 mile an hour. And he jo jokingly said that years before Isabel. 
And sure enough, about 2.30 that afternoon, I had a leak <laughs> right where he said it would come if the wind blew on a mile and off. A few minutes after, that's when the roof went one way <laughs> and it flipped back over the other way. So I pretty much said, yeah, he's right on target with that. It was it was a long night. It was, oh my goodness, it, it seemed like it would go on and on and on and on forever. It's now moving very quickly to the northwest at 24 miles an hour, and that is important as regards the rainfall forecast. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. First, let's take a look at some winds, and they are still gusting to over 60 miles an hour in eastern North Carolina. And then farther So I call my sister and say, hey, I'm coming over here. So as I was going down Albemarle Street, the water where the um, sewer lines, they were stopping up, and it was covering my tires. So I went to our house, Gail Street was terrible. And um, when we were in her house, all of a sudden, I guess after I had been there about 20 minutes, my brother came in and said, oh my God, said the, uh, the church is coming apart. And I mean, when we all went to the front door, there was the, the siding, part of the siding was coming down and, and everything. And I'm like, oh my goodness, we stood out there in the rain and watched it, you know. We cried. We actually cried. A lot of physical damage, economic impact, emotional turmoil. Uh, in fact, we lost a citizen uh, during that time, Angelique Jones. All that was difficult. You know, you don't question God about his work. You don't question God why, you know. There's a reason for everything that happens. And um, we just stood there and um, we held each other and we cried. So we said, well, um, this is our home. We can do what we can.
the next morning, I woke up about seven o'clock, daylight, not having slept very much, but I probably slept a little bit off and on. And I walked out and looked at the street in front of us and then looked at Charlie's um, house. And I realized that we were in deep trouble. After Isabel, you couldn't get out of town because of all the trees that covered the streets. I can remember going out to our house the next day or day and a half, and I could only get so far on 32. And I had to park and walk the rest of the way because of all the trees down and stuff. This was probably the only time that we were having people come to the shelter after the storm. Individuals whose uh, homes may have been flooded or otherwise damaged and had no other place to go. We had a lot of people just show up in our lobby, not necessarily injured, but nowhere to go. We could not leave the shelter until we got an okay because I stayed there from the time it was open to the time it ended. Um, and so, no, I could not leave. And we also want to let people know we're getting a lot of calls in from, from people who are asking about the man convenience site, the trash collection site. Right. Um, we are working right now to try to get all of those open. Uh, waste management. We were open for about, almost seemed like two weeks. It was over eight days, eight, nine days. Charlie said we were sitting on his his front porch, which had been torn off the front of his house and sitting in the middle of Water Street after the storm had subsided, he looked at me and said, what stick are we going to pick up first? <laughs> Later this afternoon, Let me put it this way. We were green, down and out. We were down. We were down. <laughs> Hadn't been for FEMA, this town wouldn't be here. It took a while for the National Guard to get here. I mean, it, it was a slow developing uh, recovery. And we were forced to do most of it on our own for the first several days. But it, the town just responded unbelievably. I remember when I was accepted the position here, the CEO I worked for up north had been in Tulane as a, uh, an executive. And he said, well, you know, you may not like the snow, but snow doesn't take the roof off your house. And I always thought, oh. <laughs> and then when I experienced Isabel, I was like, oh my God. I mean, because it, it, it really decimated the town. I mean, it was just unbelievable. I think we were out of electricity for seven days, something like that, and water. Um, you know, it, it was a challenge running the hospital. Jeff did a great job at the hospital. I'm uh, we were very fortunate, I don't know if he told you it or not, but his generators kicked on, you know, to run the hospital. They were up and running, no, no missile services there. And the first line that Anne Marie was able to get back on line, E and W, was the line that took care of the hospital. Yay. A body of water just bowling over three times, three times. Huh? And his partner, I, I mentioned to him, he said, man, I love those deuce and ass. I'll never say another bad thing about it. And I, I told him, I said, you know, I was listening to the story that- Greenville Utilities, I remember those guys, I would try to greet every crew that came into town. They would come to the electric department and I would, you know, welcome them and thank them and tell them we were gonna take good care of them. And this one guy from Greenville said, girl, you got a mess on your hands. <laughs> They could see, you know, all the poles down on the way in from the Chowan River Bridge. And I laughed at that. I said, well, you're going to help us get out of this mess, right? And he said, yes, ma'am. Also, they're going to have another Salvation Army. Oh, Greenville? Oh, yeah, Greenville. They, they, they top the line. They'll send a hundred truck down here if you need it. Greenville Utilities sent a couple crews in here, and they are basically rebuilt or well, patch. All we did was patch and move, patch and move, patch and move. Because, you know, and then later we got the funds to go back and do some things permanently. But Greenwood Utilities guys were great. My hat's off to the electric people and the water department people. They, they did an excellent job with county and city. I had this uh, pole company send me six loads of poles 
All the people were desperate. They sent us our poles. We we estimated that the, due to the storm, we had approximately, probably a little bit more than three hundred thousand dollars worth of damage, uh, in, throughout all the facilities, in two thousand three dollars. So it would have been a little bit more. At that time, the elementary schools, White Oak and D.F. Walker, were relatively new, and they they experienced uh, uh, some of the, the lesser damage. Uh, the high school uh, experienced the greatest amount of damage. Middle school, second after that. So we had to replace the roof, um, and then of course we had to replace uh, the walls that were blown in and uh, of course repaint everything and treat for uh, algae or or anything like that and then we we realized then that we had to raise the house We had, I'll, I'll never forget this, it's stuck in my mind, we had a, the system, uh, our healthcare system brought in a bank of job johnnies because we didn't have any toilets. And so we, we kind of became a central place. People wanted to go to the bathroom. And, and then, of course, there was people that required oxygen, you know, and they couldn't get deliveries or whatever. So we, we kind of had to help deal with that and deal with the shelters that needed that kind of assistance. We helped in the debris management. We didn't take we didn't take the lead, but we helped in that. Um, any medical needs, you know, I had home health, I had hospice, I had transportation. So we were using our transportation buses to get people where they needed to go. If somebody needed nursing care, you know, we could send somebody like we, like we got a call one day about somebody couldn't get their diabetes med, so we dispatch a nurse to see what it is we could do and how we could help them. Public health was like not the overarching theme, but we were kind of in the middle of the road people. We, we were the catch-all. The very first thing that we did is the, the, uh, the corporate person, the person who was the manager, he drove his pickup truck down here from Greenwood and brought us water and ice and lots and lots of stuff. And we actually physically unplugged all the computers and all the, all the hard drives and, and the printers and everything that we needed to put the newspaper out. We moved the entire production operation to a conference room in Greenville and carried all of our people with us and we were able to produce the newspaper. Becky was here, the other reporter was here, Sean was his name, and they, they, they fed the stories to us any way that they could, remembering that we didn't have the quick text and the quick internet and things at that time. I remember sleeping on the back porch. Uh, it's, it was just too hot inside. I think after the first week, saying to my family, we, we got to go for a drive. I can't stand listening to generators running and chainsaws because that's all you heard was generators running and chainsaws. That was one of the more sickening things, for lack of a better word, was to try to go to sleep every night with the windows open and generators running in every yard on Wharf Street. It just sounded like a factory over there. It was this chainsaw week. I can remember hearing the chainsaws all week long, just cutting, cutting. We piled debris uh, alongside of the road. looked like looked like forts, and it you know it took it took a while for that all that debris to go. We found a roadside 
um, and he wrote a street sign behind our house from the country club. At that time, the chamber had the tourism authority, the economic development, membership services, and Main Street were all in the same roof. So each director had their different areas they were covering. Nancy was in charge of all the hospitality. Um, our Main Street, of course, was right there in town to make sure of those people. And when, when I say they would check on those people, it would be a face-to-face -face walk in and look at them not just a drive-through so we would know exactly what the deal was. I took the economic piece, uh, which was the manufacturing base, which was outside the city limits in some cases, and um, Brenda Spruill, who was our membership director, took the rest of the chamber membership. At that time, we had about 300 members. My hat's off to what I call uh, the all-American quarterbacks. Anne Marie and Cliff were there. They knew what to do. And then we had Doug Belch, the EMS guy. So between the three, Doug had practiced us for, for years on disaster drills. And I had been a volunteer fireman, uh, captain in the fire department, so I knew what the disaster drills were all about. They weren't necessarily designed for hurricanes, but it's pretty, pretty much the same deal. I was going to the hotels and the bed and breakfasts and the restaurants and, you know, to make sure that they had what they needed and were able to provide what needed to take place in their businesses. There's a restaurant called Lee's Country Kitchen over near Greenville, and he sent every single day, he sent a hundred lunches here. Uh, for the for the emergency workers and they were and they were hot when they got here. He sent a couple of insulated containers of food to the EOC every day for a week or more. Every day. Didn't get paid anything. He did that to help. I went to uh, Greenville to a meeting one day post storm and I stopped in Lee's country store. And I was a town councilman at the time too. Stopped in Lee's country store. And I asked for the owner, manager, and uh, she didn't ask me what I wanted, nothing. The girl, she said, I'll get him, he's in the back. I came out, and when he came out, I said, told him who I was. I said, I want to thank you. He said, you don't realize how much it meant to us to have a hot meal every day. And not just a meal that, you know, wasn't a military meal. It was a meal, a home-cooked meal. And I thanked him, and he acted like it wasn't any big deal, <laughs> you know? <laughs> The armory was open and remained open even after school was reopened. Uh, and it was, it was used kind of a clearinghouse for uh, a number of agencies, including FEMA, uh, insurance companies, social services, Red Cross. Citizens could come in and, and move about and find the services they needed. Our, uh, that's where our ROTC program was located, and uh, it gave the Corps of Cadets an opportunity to serve as host, manage people, and help uh, move that process along. So it was a, it was a, a great learning experience for our, our students as well. Uh, a while ago, uh, yesterday and the day before, there was still water, uh, standing water on some of the roads, uh, but not enough where you can't turn off. Paul Woff came in with his backhoe. And I remember I got behind him. I was in my in my Jeep and I could there were trees everywhere. And I couldn't get downtown. But Paul came by my house with his backhoe and he cleared the road. <laughs> he just went down and he was pushing trees out of the way. And it, it was him on the on the backhoe. And he didn't hire it out. And I got right behind him. I, I was driving into town. And as he cleared the trees, I would go right behind him and I, I made it down to the office. Uh, it wasn't some, something his company had contracted to do. He just did it. He was very given. He was known for that. Um, and after he passed, actually, people would come up to us afterwards and tell people of all walks of life and say, he did this for me, he did that, you know. He, he loved, I mean, he loved the town and he loved the 
progress it was making and being part of it, I think. It's like what he's done his whole life, so he is happy to do it. Kermit and Lainey Layton, their daughter, um, Corey and her husband Poe, had planned their wedding for that weekend. And honestly, uh, I had kind of forgotten about it through everything, but they decided to go ahead with the wedding. And they needed a location for a reception, and they had the reception at our house, at my husband and my house. I think because we knew that the wedding would happen no matter what, we just felt like we would have to deal with whatever happened as it came. My future in-laws had come from Kansas and my future grandmother-in-law had been visiting from South Korea. So we needed to have the wedding while we had both of them in town. The wedding was moved to Edenton Baptist Church. Everyone was able to pull together and help us have a wonderful wedding. I would say our wedding was very much like the saying, life goes on. Let's see, he just showed me right up to here. That's his high watermark. For a small town at, at the time, you know, we had to kind of cash flow the recovery and that was a lot of money, I remember. <laughs> you know, I, I remember when, you know, one of our goals was to have all the debris up by Thanksgiving. You know, we just did not want people to have to look at all that stuff. And, and we met that goal. I remember one time not hearing chainsaws anymore. I'll never forget working, you know, side by side with Cliff, my good friend, and um, Peter Rasco was the county special projects officer, and, and Richard with the chamber was such a key piece. And I remember Cliff telling us early on that, you know, the way we're going to get out of this thing is, you know, we don't need to be afraid to make decisions. And, you know, that's what we did. I, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm down here behind Lester's house now. Yeah, we got a problem. Whew. Peter Roscoe was a real instrumental person. He knew how to get things done. <laughs> As a threat to public health and safety, and we are going to try to petition them to rethink that policy. Cliff physically assigned him to, from the, until this is over with, this is what you do, and he got it done. I'll be honest with you, that man was remarkable. And those boys from Arkansas and, and Kansas and Alabama with those trucks that had those cranes on them that would reach over and pick up my trees. And those lumber people came in with trucks that were 20, 30 feet tall. Yeah. And they had to clear the streets up and everything was piled 15, 20 feet tall. Place them on the road. Those guys came in, lifted those trees up and took them away and lifted the constant reminder that we were under assault from Mother Nature. But we survived it, and we survived it because we pulled together, and we survived it because of the help from others. We even had two central office uh, staff members who took it upon themselves, and they went out and canvassed um, uh, Davis Place and, and uh, Chowan Court and just kind of walked through the neighborhood, trying to find out where are we, uh, what situations are we in. And we began to compile a list of some needs. We had other school districts at that time who were beginning to collect and donate children's clothing, backpacks, school supplies. Uh, so uh, we, had, we were able to bring those in and have those on hand to work with, with our, provide that for our students. Perhaps the best thing we could do for our children, as well as our staff, was to provide uh, some sort of normalcy that at least during the school day they could be removed and from 
from the stressors that they were experiencing at home and, and in the community from all the recovery efforts. Kadish Church, you know, their church, of course, we all know was, you know, practically, you know, well, not destroyed, but damaged beyond. Um, and they cooked like every day for four days um, on Gale Street to feed, you know, their neighbors, but then also to help feed, um, you know, some of the um, workers that were in town trying to clear the roads. So we fed the community right up there on the church ground, removed the, the, the debris that was out there, and um, we fed the community. And, uh, and it was like, you know, Katie's just gone. And my brother said, no, it's not gone. It's not gone. It's not gone. It's still standing. I remember uh, Becky interviewing some of the members of the church, and, they, and, and one of the quotes that sticks out, I'm, I'll paraphrase it, I'm certainly not going to hit it right on the button, was that they said, that building is not the church, we are the church. I still think about those days when it was full. We were there having a good time. And, uh, and I think about it today. You know, our congregation is so small. But the few that we have, we're doing the best we can. Even though Isabel tried to take it away, you know, she wasn't that powerful. She wasn't more powerful than God that she would take it all away from us, you know. And uh, One thing our community did, um, her for community, we were a tight knit and we still always are. We had grills and we got in the middle of the road and we cooked as a community and we all ate as a community. Um, that was really, really special to me. Um, and I mean, it was just wonderful. You, you rode around town and what you smelled was people trying to cook their barbecue their steaks and their hamburger and their, whatever they had was going bad in their refrigerators. And that's a memory that stuck in my mind, just the smell around town when everybody was cooking. Everybody was charcoal grilling or gas grilling or whatever they had. I tell you, the customer was good. They, really they were good because even after the storm, weeks after the storm, they would bring stuff to us, feed us and all kinds of stuff. It, it was amazing. Rowan was right on the job as mayor. Um, he was out there and talking to people and keeping everybody informed. And Marie was. Uh, back then, Cliff Copeland was. You know, the community really rose up. You know, they would, if mayor was speaking at an event, people would just stand up and start clapping and thanking him because he was, he was you know, the inspiration, he kept saying, we're gonna get past this and we just gotta be strong, we gotta work together. I think he did a lot of work that people don't, probably don't recognize or don't remember. I got a phone call and said that, uh, just, just the way you phrased it, said we want to send one of our reporters over to shatter you. I said, wow, you know, I was flattered by it all, quite honestly. As far as how Isabel stacks up, especially for Edenton in the western part of the of the Sound region, that's definitely the worst storm that that, that we folks living today um, have experienced. One thing that's really improved, and I think where we can take a lot of confidence, is in the forecast tracks. So, so you know, and, and they've really gotten very accurate, and, and we've actually doubled the accuracy since since Isabel. And when I cut grass today. 20 years later, I'm able to ride around trees that are still leaning in the direction of the 100 mile an hour wind that's in, that's in my yard. So it's a constant reminder. And we're glad that you came and tell all your friends to come visit us. That <laughs> Paradise is not lost. Um, just because a bunch of old trees fell doesn't mean that 
um, paradise is lost. Edenton in Chawan County is, the people here are very resilient. Certainly uh, here in Chowan County, we had uh, many, many citizens, whether young or old, rich or poor, left or right, it just didn't, didn't matter. They, they, uh, we had so many people who, who rose and, and passed that test of character with flying colors. People were supporting each other. People were neighbors helping neighbors. And the same with my staff. I mean, I, I would give you a particular story, but they were all good stories. You know, they were all good stories and they all just did a great job. And, and it just made me realize that, yeah, I had done the right thing coming here. I had done the right thing. <laughs>